Hello everyone! Hi! Welcome to the very first episode of Good Morning Lofra. I'm Raphael. And I'm Isabel. And we're here to talk to you about the issues that we find important as university students, as well as showcasing the many talented students we have here at Loughborough. And this is what's coming up today. Coming up, Lawrence Mulligan, a Loughborough finalist, discusses his musical inspirations and the release of his latest single. And we'll also be joined by Craig Brown to hear his story about how he became the founder of Loughborough Against Corona. First of all, joining us now is the Action Chair, Jody Evans, who is going to talk us about this year Action Jingle Bells campaign. It's Operation Jingle Bells time! Operation Jingle Bells is a campaign run annually by Loughborough Student Union's Action Team. This year we're launching it on Monday the 29th of November and it'll be running until Monday the 13th of December. We do this by having you, our lovely students and staff, donate Christmas presents. This year, we are supporting three incredible charities, Leicestershire Toys on the Table, Life Beacon, and the Charmwood Toy Appeal. To support them, we need your help, the staff and students at Loughborough. You can donate to the campaign in three ways. Number one, you can drop off a physical donation in our sleigh. Number two, you can buy a toy on the Amazon wish list and have it sent directly to us at LSU. Or number three, a simple monetary donation on our Just Giving page. We recommend that the toys cost between £5 and £10. That way, every single child has a chance to have a magical Christmas. To find out everything that you need to know and to bring a child some joy this Christmas, go to lsu.co.uk forward slash jingle bells. Merry Christmas! <laughs> And see. We good? Did I go out of frame? Good morning, Jody. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today. So you were re-elected at the end of last year as Action Chair. So this is your second year as um, Action Chair, right? So how's everything going? How are you dealing with all the all the things you need to do? Just tell us a little bit more um, about that. It's very different from last year. So last year we had the COVID Community Champion mm -hmm. Scheme, which kind of took over my role. And um, we didn't get a lot of our action projects out there. Um, this year, almost all of our action projects are off and running already, um, which is really lovely to see. Um, I think we hit like 2,000 hours of volunteering already. Wow. And in the total of last year, we only hit 3,000. Oh I say God. only, it's still amazing for COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's a lot of work. Um, but it's absolutely amazing work what we do. Oh, that's so oh. amazing to hear that all your campaigns can run this year. And one of the campaigns you're running is Action for Jingle Bells. So can you tell us a little bit about your ideas behind this campaign? Yeah, um, so it started in 2018 when Joel Brocklehurst was chair. Mm -hmm. um, and he basically um, found a charity, Leicestershire Toys on the Table, mm -hmm. and really loved what they did. So they go around to different children in Leicestershire, make sure that they have a present to open on Christmas Day. Um, which is just, it's a really lovely idea. It's so heartwarming, isn't it? Yeah, so he then talked to our team at Loughborough um, Students Union and basically created this whole Operation Jingle Bells campaign where people can donate presents by either bringing in a physical donation or doing monetary donations on d Just Giving. Um, and it just kind of spiralled from there. It's become an annual thing. In the past three years, we've donated over 2,000 toys. Um, so this is the fourth year of the campaign. Um, and hopefully we can match last year. So last year we hit a thousand toys. So it would be amazing to get that That's again. That's incredible. And so from the video, we could see that you are um, uh, supporting more charities this year. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so um, we usually just work with Toys on the Table, but we've been approached um, by other charities because they know the success of our campaign. So the Charmwood Toy Appeal, which is a bit more of a local, smaller charity, mm -hmm. have come to us and said, they need help supporting the 600 children that they normally support. Mm -hmm. um, and then Life Beacon is a charity which runs one of our action projects mm -hmm. and they work with um, children and young mums in Africa. So we wanted to support them as well. Wow, so Life Beacon's quite different to the other charities you support. Why did you choose to support them this year? Um, so Life Beacon was actually set up by a postgraduate in Loughborough. Um, her name's Ruby, she's really lovely. Um, so she came to us last year said, I want to make Life Beacon into an action project. So mm -hmm. they go into secondary schools um, with volunteers normally who are the first in the family to go to university to kind of help show the children that 
you can do anything that you put your mind to. If you want to go to university, there shouldn't be anything stopping you. If you want to do an apprenticeship, anything like that. So it's there to inspire children. Um, and then what Ruby also does with the charity is every January she goes um, to different parts of Africa. Um, she gives um, new mums and their babies a gift because when mm -hmm. a stranger gives a gift um, to a young mum in Africa, it means that baby's special, so they're going to really care for it. Mm -hmm. um, and then they also do a back to school um, project. And so they go into schools and they give about 200 kids a backpack full of stationary equipment they would need to get through school. And it's just something like little that we take for granted mm -hmm. here but they mm -hmm. really appreciate over there. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And other than knowing that they've made Child Christmas, what kind of other incentives can students um, get to be involved <laughs> in this campaign? So we're at Loughborough, it's a bit competitive, so we're always going <laughs> to put a bit of a competitive aspect on things. Um, any student group, um, we've challenged them all this year to raise £100, so that would wow. equate to about uh, 10 to 20 presents. Um, so we're asking them the top um, society, we're going to give them £100 to their committee so they can do something for the society, mm -hmm. same for their hall. Um, we're looking into what we can do for departments, AE clubs, enterprise groups, welfare associations mm -hmm. as well. Um, but money is money, it's where you mm -hmm. can get it from. Mm -hmm. um, as well as that, um, our committee, so the action committee and the executive team um, are all doing challenges. So um, if we hit a certain amount of to toys, um, then you can go and throw some sponges at exec in, the <laughs> in some stocks. Um, if we hit two and a half thousand toys, then I've said I'll get a tattoo. Probably. Oh, wow. wow, that's Gun a big yeah. commitment there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it like it ranges quite a lot between the, each milestone, but we really want to show like we're really pushing for it, mm -hmm. and yeah. if we can get a, a two and a half thousand toys, then I will happily have an alpaca or something <laughs> put on my skin for life. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Oh, Incredible. that's so exciting. And we wish you the best with your campaign. You mentioned on the video that you had a wish list. What's your favourite toy on the wish list? Oh, I spent like <laughs> a whole day making this. It was so much fun. Um, I probably did, there's a thing called ugly dolls and they're like mm. little teddy, like plush teddy bears um, that I think are adorable, but they're called ugly dolls because they're like they're missing an eye or they've only got like a book tooth oh. or something. So <laughs> I think they're my favourite. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Oh, and and how, are, how else are you raising money for this campaign? Um, so the campaign's running in line with the festive calendar that LSU are producing mm -hmm. this year. Um, so um, on our launch day, um, it's the Winter Showcase. So we've got our bake sale going on at the Winter Showcase and any money that we um, take in will go towards Operation Jingle Bells. Um, we've also got a stall at the Rag Christmas Market on the closing day of Jingle Bells, so Monday the 13th of December. Um, and everything we're selling there will have been made on one of our projects by elderly residents or children. Well, Jody, thank you so much you for coming much. in to talk to us today. That's and we amazing. wish you the best of luck with your campaign. Yeah. Thank you. Very good luck. <laughs> Still to come, we have Lawrence here on studio talking about his life, his passion for music, and an exclusive live performance of his newest single. But up next, we will be talking to Craig Brown, who is one of the co-founders of Students Against Corona. Hi, my name is Craig Brown. I am the founder of Loughborough Against Corona and the co-founder of a bigger global organisation called Students Against Corona. And what we do is coordinate an army of thousands of volunteers uh, and we connect them to people that are in need as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So we've been doing and coordinating jobs uh, like uh, prescription pickups from pharmacies working alongside the NHS. Uh, we've been giving uh, elderly people calls to make sure that their you know their well-being is okay and, and that they're still getting that socialization they need we've been facilitating uh, picking up groceries from, uh, sh from, sh from the shops and just making sure that those that are isolating or vulnerable or shielding are getting the groceries that they need. And just generally trying to help those that have been most affected by the, by the restrictions that are in place as a result of the pandemic. Both locally and internationally, we've worked with many stakeholders, but most importantly, we've worked with uh, the Royal College of GPs and in particular, the former past president, President Nakani, uh, in formulating uh, some risk assessments and health and safety guidelines so that volunteers uh, that do want to help and do their bit during this pandemic have the PPE that's necessary to do so and are behaving in a way that uh, protects people from spreading the virus and making the situation worse because the last thing we want is for the situation to be exacerbated by people's good efforts. We founded Love Against Corona initially and then Students Against Corona because I, well, I, I personally had a family member that um, was uh, vulnerable and shielding and I wasn't able to book a food delivery online because of the, the, the massive demand that um, was put upon these services. So, you know, 
she called me and said that you know, she felt very isolated and wasn't able to get the help that she needed and I was too far away uh, to help her myself so we put a Facebook post out locally and said you know is there anybody else that, that, that needs anything doing is there anybody else in need and we had a massive response of people that needed help and an abundance of, of, of people that, that, that really wanted to help and volunteer their time especially young people and students that were you know perceived as less vulnerable to the virus so we made an effort just to you know coordinate all of these lovely gestures of, of goodwill and wanting to help and try and put them to good use in the best way that we could. So we are joined by Craig now. Craig, thank you so much for joining okay, us. No Can you, you talk to us a little bit more about why you decided to found Loughborough Against Corona? Sure. I mean, I, th I guess I felt a bit useless when the pandemic started because, <laughs> I, I mean, I had an events business whilst I was at university and uh, that had been going well. We had lots of events lined up and then obviously the pandemic came out of nowhere. So I just sort of sat at home, not much to do and just felt like, you know, there's got to be something we can do just to fill the time, really. So I... Uh, yeah, I, I, I put a, a Facebook post out just to see if anybody needs some shopping doing or, do you mm. know, anything we could do sort of to help. And the just response of people that needed help was just overwhelming. And then, like, mm. the response from people that wanted to help was there as well. So I just figured, you know, maybe, you know, maybe use some of the skills I learned in my degree doing, you know, business and just mm -hmm. try and coordinate those efforts so that I could put the people that wanted to help in touch with the people, you know, that needed help and, and, and just to see if we could make that happen. So, uh, yeah, once we got that response, a, a, a couple of... Um, different press places got hold of it and, and put it out there and then it just sort of in a couple of days just blew up into something mm -hmm. into something that I, I didn't really expect to be honest. So yeah. incredible. It's incredible because you founded Love for Against Corona but then you expanded it into Students Against Corona. How did you become one of the co-founders of, of this campaign? Well I guess we had, a, I had a, th a few friends that were just sort of you know had a similar idea to me different cities uh, I, I had a good friend in, in Oxford that was trying to do something similar mm -hmm. and um, we just decided we'd sort of pull our efforts together and try and coordinate what we were doing um, one of the biggest issues that we were sort of hearing about was that there are loads of really well-intentioned people that were trying their best to help but could have inadvertently been making the problem worse mm -hmm. just by not making, you know, taking the right precautions, not yeah. wearing the correct PPE, not having the right provisions. Um, so we just wanted to get some sort of simple processes in place that were signed off by institutions that mm -hmm. said, you know, this is safe for you to do mm -hmm. um, and and use all of our resources that we built up in terms of um, even just organising how to put people in touch with each other, how to make sure people are safe, how to make sure that the vulnerable are safeguarded, all of these things that took quite a while to get going. Mm -hmm. If we could just, you know, give those resources to other people in, in, in other places that were trying to do what we were doing, then we could at least, you know, make sure that all of those good efforts were going in the right way and they weren't making things worse you know yeah. accidentally and yeah. how does it feel to have founded this international campaign that's helped and changed so many people's lives you must be very proud well, it's, it's, it's an honor to to represent the people that that you know that have all helped mm -hmm. uh I, I i've said many times even over the course of the pandemic that, that when i say there's an army i mean there was an army of people that were so willing um, to, to be selfless and, and to make sacrifice and to try their best to pull other people out of the situation that we all found ourselves in. And I've met some remarkable people and I've had people that have volunteered for months on end, spending 40, 50, 60 hours a week working and to coordinate what we're doing and, and just to, to be a spokesperson for them and to be able to help coordinate the, the amazing work they've done. It, it's, it's just a massive honour and a privilege and I'm so grateful to have experienced, you know, the... I guess it's restored my faith in humanity a little bit. You know that people like that are out there and they are so willing to help and do the right, and do the right thing. You should be proud that that is amazing. Um, so of course we're now returning to a supposed normality, but of course COVID <laughs> is still here. Yeah, so yeah, what are still... your predictions for the next couple of months in terms of COVID and? I, <laughs> I think anybody that has a prediction and stands by it is lying. Um, <laughs> it's it's such a difficult one, isn't it? And um, obviously. We stepped in at the beginning because there was a, there's a lot of bureaucracy when you're trying to set new things up and it's difficult for big institutions like the government mm -hmm. and charities to, to really um, bridge that initial gap in terms of need. So we stepped in to fill that gap and, and we did our best for it. But as sort of institutions started to catch up and the infrastructure was there, the need for sort of um, grassroots intervention slowly sort of declined and resilience put up a little bit in the community. So that's a good thing. And I, I do think that even if we do see things get worse and deteriorate, there is an element of resilience now. The biggest issue was that we were facing the unknown before and that drove a lot of fear, mm -hmm. a lot of uncertainty, mm -hmm. a lot of anxiety yeah. in people. So I don't know how we'll move forward. I know there are some variants on the horizon, you know, potentially, but uh, I think that with the with the vaccination efforts that, are, that, have, that have taken place and 
and with you know the fact that we all know what we're dealing with to some extent yeah. now then i am yeah. optimistic that we can you know continue to live through this pandemic mm -hmm. that definitely isn't going anywhere mm -hmm. anytime soon. Yeah. Yeah. And we've been so lucky to have people like you who are willing to give up their time to help other people. Um, what else do you want to achieve with Students Against Corona and Loughborough Against Corona in the next few months? Well, I, we've, we've sort of transitioned to, um, to putting all of our infrastructure in the hands of more established institutions because we wanted to make sure that, well, we felt a duty of responsibility to the people mm -hmm. that we were helping. Mm -hmm. Um, we were volunteers. It's not sustainable to go on forever. We were in a very unique situation where lots mm -hmm. of people had lots of free time and, and were able to do that. But it, I don't think it'd be fair for the people that we've helped and, and you know, to, to leave them without the support they need just because we can't facilitate that anymore. So what we've done is transition so that all of our infrastructure has mm -hmm. gone into the hands of local charities that are established and the council, uh, John Storrow House in Loughborough in particular, and they've taken over our CRM and our database and they're mm -hmm. going to look at how they can serve the people that we've been serving um, in, you know sort of long term so that those people have the support they need and they can sort of build the resilience in the community so that mm -hmm. all these people aren't so dependent as they have been so um, so yeah we, we're, we're, we're there volunteers we've got we, we've got the, the the group is ready to launch up again if the need ever you know if the needs there but uh, we, we're just happy to have sort of stepped in when we when when we were able to and now we sort of left it to those that are, are more equipped to deal with this long term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now we can all see that you're very focused on students against Corona, love for against Corona. But what would you like to do next? Yes, a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, I found in my events business in in uh, whilst I was in my second year at university, and uh, that was Enzo Bespoke Events, and we had. Uh, you know, loads on, on the horizon. And, and it was really weird because obviously when the pandemic, you know, stops all that happening, mm -hmm. I sort of felt a bit, you know, what do I do now? So we ran the charity. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I worked as a, a manager at a test and trace site in Loughborough as well for, for a, a, well, about eight months as well. So I've sort of done, you know, whatever I, I, can, I can to get through the <laughs> pandemic. But now I'd really like to see the events business grow. I'd like to go back to doing what I enjoy and doing what I love. And it's great to see that, um, you know, that industry starting to reopen and students are enjoying having some nightlife and, and we're able to offer some, some different things. So I'm hoping that will continue to grow and I can, yeah, just, just have a, you know, a good year or two just trying to, you know, do what I tried to do a couple of years ago, yeah. I suppose. Well, yeah. we wish you all the, best all the best with your events business. Thank, Thank you, you so, much. so much for all the Thank hard you. work you did for Corona. You helped so many people. And thank you so much for talking to us today. Much thank appreciated. Thanks much. for having me. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, up next on the show, we will have Lawrence, who is going to talk about his passion for music, his potential career in the music industry, and he's going to perform his new song here at Good Morning Loughborough. It only took a day. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you on the show this morning. Thanks for having me, yeah. We're very excited to hear you later on on the show. But first question, first question. How did you get into singing and music? Um, it's something I've done since I was like four, five, six. I've always been kind of just like chiming away on like xylophones or pianos or <laughs> uh, stuff like that. So yeah, it's just been lifelong kind of messing around with music really. Yeah. So, you are a singer, but you're also a songwriter. Yeah. What inspires you the most when you write music? Um, recently, it's kind of been like the places I've been and like the people I've met. So, during last year, I was living in Italy for a year. And it was all, I was writing all the songs about the people I met and like the place I was. Mm -hmm. And when I told people, I was writing songs about them and about this town I was living in. Like, why are you writing about Latina? Why are you, why are you writing? Because there's nothing interesting going on here. But for me, it was like out of the norm, kind of like interesting for me. So, when it comes to music, do you have a role model? Um, so many people. Uh, I think uh, a few of the artists I really admire are like, well, admired uh, Elliot Smith and kind of Michael Kiwanuka and all those guys who are just kind of just 
or did or have done some like just really interesting stuff. Yeah, uh, but yeah, go on. Um, yeah. Why do they inspire you? Um, the individuality. They just they just like they just sound like them, and it's not kind of like just. They, they, they sound like how they act and how they walk and how they talk and it's just like very personal to them, their sound, and I just find that really interesting. Natural music and yeah. raw and comes from the heart. So we're going to hear your brand new song, Toffo Street Food, yeah. later. Very exciting. So what's the story behind this single? What inspired you to create this song? Um, so it was a, it's a song about a cafe called Toffo Street Food which was the cafe that I lived across from when I was on my placement year living in Italy. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of about going there every morning and like my routine throughout the day and just kind of like living this life that I'd never really led before, mm -hmm. having like living in Loughborough <laughs> for a couple of years and then going off and living in Italy. It's a big, it's a big change. Very so different places, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you released the music and then when, how did you feel when you found out that your track was being played in BBC Introducing? That must have been an incredible. It was. It was feeling. very surreal. It was very surreal. We were all. Um, it was the day. The day I released the song, we, uh, me and a few friends, were just at the pub, and I was playing on a speaker, um, being like, "Oh, new song released." It was all really <laughs> fun. And then, as the song finished, I checked my emails, and I had an email from BBC Introducing, being like, "Oh, we're going to play a song." <laughs> and yeah, it was really cool because they told me it would take six months to listen. And then it was like three days later that they, they played oh it. So. That's amazing. amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. It must have felt so cool to hear your song on live radio. But do you have any plans for new songs? Are you writing new music at the moment so, as so well? So many plans, so many, <laughs> so many plans. Um, I, was, I was living in Loughborough over summer once I got uh, back from living abroad and I've been pretty much writing music for the past like three months, like recording it all. I wrote it all when I was there, uh, like living abroad, and then I'm kind of like now putting it all into the computer and recording it all and layering it all. But it's all, I do it all myself, so like, and I've got no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> like, it's all just kind of like a guitarist playing a bass, and like, <laughs> then I'm kind of like learning how to mix and master, which is just, and it's all kind of, it's all very rushed, it's all very like kind of like whirlwind, but well. it's fun. That's incredible. Thank you very much for joining us today. We wish you all the best. Mm -hmm. so, Cheers, guys. Thank yeah. you. And with Lawrence's song being released on BBC Introducing, we know he's got a bright future ahead of him. That's everything we have for today. We hope you have enjoyed as we did this first episode of Good Morning Love, Bro. But now, here he is now in an exclusive live performance of his new single, Top of Street Food. Here it is, Lawrence Mulligan. See, See you, you next, next time. Week. Screaming on Sunday afternoon 
A stadium full of ghosts But my shuttle's closed And I can't see in Even if I try So I stare at the mountains The world is passing by An alien spaceship That decided to stay And an army of ghosts To replace the people Who would watch the game